how to play the game of life. And I know that's a different idea. I know it just kind of dropped inside me that that's what we were. Some, some, some of the things that I'd read just kind of pricked me to think that because we are in the game of life. And if we don't learn to play it, then we'll struggle or fight or war, battle, do all those things that, that we don't want to do. Any of y'all have ever done that? I, I've done that, do things I don't want to do, but then I do it. And most of the time, the only reason I do it is because I'm, I'm ignorant. I'm not, I'm not abreast of the information. I'm not aware. I'm not, uh, I'm not really conscious of what's happening in my life. And so as a result of that, generally calamity or, or mistakes or different things happen. So let me just read you a few things here that I wrote. Uh, we're not here in the earth life to war, to fight, to battle, or to struggle. And yet, I guess most of us do that. And like, again, why do we do that? Does it, does it give us benefit or does it uh, cause us to have detriment, takes away from us? And I'd say the latter, it's going to take away from us. It's not, it's not going to benefit you at all. Uh, so most of us through or because of ignorance or the lack of instructions. You know, sometimes you're not doing something just because you're ignorant. To, to be ignorant simply means to ignore, just to not, just to not Ignore. I mean, I know I ignore a lot of things. I, I ignored the speed limit on the highway. I don't pay a bit of attention to it, hardly ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a purposeful ignorance, right? I mean, it's, we do that, don't y'all? I mean, surely to God, y'all don't all drive seventy mile an hour. Thank you. So we purposefully ignore things. Well, if we, if we are habitually ignoring things, many times we might be ignoring the very things that's bringing devastation to our life. And how do we change that? And one, one of the first things we have to do is just be aware, awareness, awareness, being cognitive of what's happening. If you don't like what's happening, change what you're doing. There's not any other way to do it. And nobody else can do it for you. All we do is complain. Or, <laughs> All we do is fuss or, or talk about they did or they didn't do. And, and it, it comes right back again, looking in the mirror, because this is the one. So it, you're going to have to be responsible to yourself, not to, not to somebody else, but it's to you. So uh, lack of instructions, I think, many times is our greater problem. If we were to have someone to inform us, it's like Paul said in Romans chapter 10, he said, how will they know except they be taught? And then he, and then he goes on and he said, well, how they will, will they be taught unless a teacher sent to them? <coughs> well, many times we have teachers that come our way through circumstances in life. It could be something that we are not just cognitive of. Oh, that was something teaching me. You know, and you know, we we're, all of us in this group, you know, we're kind of aware of a lot of different things. Uh, animal speaks. Everybody got the little book, Animal Speaks, and we think, okay, okay, there's a uh, there's a uh, eagle, boom, right there, just out of the blue. There's an eagle in my life, and so what is what is that saying? And so if we don't ignore that, if we pay attention, that's all I'm saying. If we just pay attention through awareness. Yeah. This is coming to me. What's it saying to me? It's speaking to me. Life's constantly speaking to us. It's helping us. It's wanting us to play the game. It's wanting us to dance with it in this tremendous dance. It doesn't want us to struggle and to fight and to war. Because many times the struggle and the fight and the war is the things that hinders us from, the, from moving forward, from moving where we want to go. And so I... I have to, for me, I have to put in my way of thinking, lack of instructions is probably far greater than anything else that we, that we have going against us. Because many times if you're not informed, then you don't know what to do. And I think that's true so many times in so many cases with so many people that just didn't have the right instructions, the right information. If they had, they, would, they had an opportunity to do it different. I'm saying that for myself, I know, in my life. Wasn't that I was just trying to be rebellious, or wasn't that I was just trying to be ignorant? 
Yes, I may have been ignoring certain things and not paying attention, but if I had been given some clear-cut instructions, and uh, I think that's a, a key mark for a really good teacher. I know my, my algebra teacher in the ninth grade, I, he, he was a very good informer. He, was, he could really explain things, and it resonated with me, and so it was easy. I didn't have to study or read a book. I just listened, and when I would listen, I, I I never made a bad. The only thing I ever made an A in was algebra, and everything else I made I made F minuses and F plus, and every now and then I'd get a a C. That was really great if I got a C, but you know Fs or Ds or whatever. But um, I would pay attention, and when I paid attention to him, I could I could do that. I could work the problems. So I think that's a that's a real key for all of us. It's just to pay attention, and then see if. Nature itself is not informing us, or if information is not coming to us in other ways, you know, through instruction. So, information, the lack of information. Uh, so, much of our time and effort is spent in battle or struggle with the things or the situations that we need to just let go of. Have you ever had that happen to you? How do you let go of it? You know, I'd like to just take it and just turn it loose. Well, there are ways to let go of things if we would. And not and if it comes back, it comes back up in your thinking, comes back up in a situation, you just look at it, address it, and say, now look, we've talked about this. Do y'all talk to yourself? Oh, yeah. Well, good. Hallelujah. I'm not alone. I do talk to myself a lot. And, I, you know, sometimes I should listen. And sometimes I should ignore. <laughs> yeah. So there are times, so you have to be discerning for yourself because, you, again, you're going to talk to yourself. And so sometimes you have to listen to yourself. If yourself is telling you, let it go. You've already, about, you've already gone there. You settled that. Drop it. Turn it loose. Move on. Okay? So these are things, and I want to read you this out of the cipher of Genesis that I wrote. Life is meant to be a game that we play. The movements in life it is a dance. When we aren't playing or dancing, then we enter into struggle and or we get in warfare. The deception that we face or the struggle we are in is because we do not know how to play the game or haven't had instructions in the game or, the, or we get into a battle or a war and we get caught in what we get caught in is we don't know the steps of the dance. We just we're just not in tune to the dance and what we're what we're doing in the dance. And I want to read you something that Suarez said, and this is kind of where we got to this morning, because this is what the game in the this is in ancient Hebrew. It's all the glyphs in the ancient Hebrew were written in codes. Let's see if I can find this. Uh, something just flashed through my mind just then. I wanted to see if I can. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, oh well, it it has to do with uh, the Hebrew glyphs. All the Hebrew glyphs are just characters. Of energy, that's what they are. So the alif is equivalent to like our English a. The bet or vet, whichever way you like, so you can say it with a b or a v, as in Victor, or in Beth, Betty. You can say it either way. It's a, called a double. It's the first of the doubles. There's seven doubles in the Hebrew, and the seven doubles refers to the duality of the seven facets of the stick man. Or the chakras, or the endocrine glands, or whatever, the, because they are they are dual. They are in this dualistic world. This dualistic world that we're in is not right or wrong. It's just a world that we're in. And when we can play the game of this world, we can win. <laughs> Hallelujah! That, and that's a good thing about it. So the Hebrew glyphs, when uh, you start to see them, and you realize they're facets of energy. They and each one represents energy in a different. Fashion, you know, coming at it from a different angle. It's not that the olive is better than any of the other glyphs. It's not. It's equal. They all they all represent the same 
energy but different facets of that energy. The way the energy moves or the, what the energy is doing. And you know, to grasp that or try to get an understanding of that, Hebrew, ancient Hebrew is just a different language. It's, a, it's not really a language uh, unless we use the symbolism as a language. And in that respect, we could probably say that it's a language. But let me read this for you right here. The cosmic and the human drama as described in the Bible is an interplay between two partners. And those two partners, and I just to put it on, this, on the board this morning, the partners is the Alif, the Alif, which is number, number one, and the Yod, I thought that was Kirby snoring. <laughs> and the Yud, which is number 10. And again, as we were just finishing this morning, I said, this glip, the Alif, is not more important than this glip, the Yud. And so when we can see that, we understand that the Hebrew, the Hebrew characters going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then start all over again at 10 and go through 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. And then start all over again and go at 100. If, if you can just get this, just kind of let this soak and settle in. All of these characters... One through nine, they have the design of the material world in that character, in that Hebrew character. Whether it's the Alif, the Bet, the Gimiel, the Dalit, the He, right on through, it doesn't matter. That character, five, the He, that has a feminine aspect about it, and it means it's, it has ability to reproduce or it's reproductive. Well, you have that inside you, whether it's bodily or or psychologically. Men have that as well as women have that. A man can reproduce. He reproduces his constant chaos. It's, I mean, you know, it, it's the same thing. And so when, if we get that, this represents the design. These, because you see, they're, they're dual. There's two characters. Only one character in each of these, one through nine. There's two characters in 10 through 90. These characters represent duality. It represents this design in the manifest world. See how simple that is? The design, that's God's design. It's source's design. It's energy. It's the design of energy. It's intelligence. That's what it is. It's intelligence. It knows. And it manifests itself in the material world. If you didn't have this, you didn't have a material world, there's no sense in having the, uh, this up here. What's the sense in having God if you don't have something to, to manifest or to show or to, to live out or to experience? God can't experience it by its own. So religion has so dumbed us down, we think that, oh, well, God's up in heaven having a party. They're having a feast. They're having a... And there ain't no such thing. <laughs> We're told that there is. So all of these glyphs, 1 through 9, they represent the design. All of these glyphs, 10 through 90, they represent the dual or the manifest world. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute. And then all of these glyphs, 100, right on through 900, then they, they represent the design that's manifest, that's come into fruition or come into its fullness of being. So all of these glyphs, 100, 200, all the way through 900, then they represent the design in its full manifestation. Or it, it's like you and me, we could say, well, I'm being led by the Spirit now. In other words, now I'm being, I'm being God manifest in the flesh. Now it's not saying that you won't make a mistake. It's saying when you do, or as you do, or if you trip, you know exactly what to do to get up. You know exactly what you need to do to get on. This is becoming aware. This is evolving. This is what we as a human species have more than... There's not any creature, period, on this world that has what you and I have. Not one. 
And so that's why when we compare ourselves to something that's much lesser than ourselves, all we do is pull ourselves down into that. And we've done that. I've done it. I've done it over and over. I read, I read from a phenomenal broad spectrum of, of people and writers, and I don't agree with a lot of them, but I agree with a lot that some of them say. I don't chunk them because I don't agree or because I read something that this one says. I, 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 don't, I don't resonate with that. I don't, and it may just be that I'm not there yet. I'm not saying that they're wrong in what that they are saying. I'm just saying I'm not there. And so it doesn't rest. If somebody's going to re- uh, call me an animal and give me an animal connotation, I'm not an animal. Now, I may not act like I'm supposed to act as an intelligent human being, but there's a lot of difference between an intelligent human being acting ignorant and doing stupid things. Y'all may not have done it. I've done a, a lot of it, a lot of the stupid things. I want to stop doing that. And how am I going to do that? I don't do that by comparing myself with something that I'm not. If I'm going to compare myself, apples with apples, oranges with oranges, then I have to compare myself with God because that's the source of my being. And it's God's the one that gave me this ability to have intelligence and to evolve and to raise my consciousness Nothing else in creation has given that. Everything in creation operates strictly on a natural basis. And all, everything in creation has an intuitive, natural ability to survive. We don't. What do you think would happen to a baby if he just was birthed and was stuck off in a corner somewhere? Do you think he's going to crawl up to his mama and nurse at her breast and get the nourishment that he needs? Won't do it. It won't do it. It can't do it. It has to be, it has to be aided. But it's the only thing that we can teach and, and, and involve or evolve its knowledge base so that it can make conscious decisions on its own. So it can keep up with its bank account. So it can keep up with its uh, score or what have you. We're it. Therefore, we are made as the image of God, as the reflection of God. Nothing else is made in that way. So if I'm going to compare myself, I'm going to compare myself to God. Now, I realize that's difficult. You don't understand why I'm saying that? You know what I mean when you say you're comparing yourself to God? I mean, you know, if you're like God, go empty the hospital. You know, if you're like God, do this. Win the lottery. Tell me what ticket number or whatever to buy. You know, all those kind of things that we get foolishly trapped into. And that's not, that's not what we're getting into. We're getting into who we are. So when we begin to look at these glyphs, then these glyphs represent you and me in our full manifestation, knowing and being what we're supposed to be, knowing and being what we're designed to be. So, so just these are little simple things that we can grasp and learn. All right, let me move that out of the way. So everything in the Scripture that we're going to read about it's going to be a dance between this and this, between the Alif and the Yod. And of course, when I'm saying the Alif, I'm not just stopping with number one, I'm going all the way through number nine. When I'm saying the Yod, I'm not stopping with ten, I'm going all the way through ninety, because each one of those glyphs represents a different facet of this energy of life that we all have. So, the cosmic and the human drama, as, it, as it's described in the Bible, is an interplay between two partners, playing against are playing with each other, the alif, the intermittent life and death, the unfantable, timeless mystery evading all mental grasp, <coughs> and the yod, its projection into the time-space continuum, which is the ante- antinomy. And antinomy just simply means that it is a contradiction. And the contradiction is like a contrast. That's all it is. Okay? The, the winner, obviously, is always the Alif because all that exists must of necessity come to an end. But the psyche, dreaming of an indefinite duration in the form of an eternal soul, for example, rejects the very notion of its own death and clings to the philosophies or the religions that encourage it to believe that it will always be here. You ain't going to always be. This physical thing is temporary. You take it off, you put it on. You take it off, you put it on. 
But we've got to we've got to come to the place that we learn that we and we are learning that we're dancing in this beautiful dance that we call life. Okay. Uh, you can you can go ahead if you want to open your Bible to Genesis chapter one, because we're going to spend some time there. Genesis chapter one. Well, not just in Genesis. We're going to spend some time in a few other passages, but Genesis. We're going to start with Genesis chapter one. Okay, I, I, I wrote these notes, and I'm just going to go through these real quickly to because we're constantly comparing ourselves to an animal. I, I mean, I, I read that, I, I talk about that, and constantly compare myself to a lower nature. And so I can't find any of that at all in Scripture. The word animal is not in the Bible. Uh, uh, my lower self, my, what are some of the names we call it? The, the names that are used in the Scripture is our sarks. That's, uh, that's a Greek word, sarks, which actually means our physical body or our what we call our human nature. It's called sarkikos. Paul calls it in, in Corinthians sarkikos, and he compares the sarkikos to the psychikos. Now you hear that? So you have, you have these words. I, I realize they sound kind of strange, don't they? Psychikos comes from the word psyche. Right? You can hear that, psyche. So psychikos just simply means you get caught in playing the game of the psyche. Sukikos comes from the Greek word from the, uh, or sarkikos comes from the Greek word sarks, flesh. That's all, just flesh. So what I want to say many times in my lower nature, in other words, just my flesh. That's what I'm talking. About, my flesh. Well, my flesh is made in the is made as the image of God. My flesh is made as the temple, the house, the very dwelling place. Just like the root system in the tree, the life in the root system is not different from the life in the manifest world system. If my physical body is the, is the manifest world, the life that's in me that you can't see is God. And the manifest world part of me that you do see is God. But I'm not trying to compare myself to God. I'm not trying to say that me and God is equal. I'm just a spark of that. So I'm a potential of that. Or I, a, a spark, that's the best, the clearest way I know how to say it. I'm not all that it is, but I'm not all that I am. But I'm getting there. I'm going to get there. Right? Yeah. Amen. I'm going to get there. So the animal is not in the Bible and it did not come into the, into the use in the English language until 1540. Okay? Now, I think religion has been behind this whole concept of, tr of trying to compare us to an animal by doing that, keeping a noose around our neck and I said this morning, let that noose be sin. So they tied that one around us pretty good. So it's hard to shake that one off. But, but we're shaking ourselves free from that one. And it was, it was pertaining to or derived from the word beast. Okay? Uh, there's never a place in Scripture where man is called a beast from the original language. There are places where they try to compare us to a beast, but they use a different terminology. Now, I'm going to get to those here in just a minute. Uh, it was pertaining to the sensation which is an animal's, including the human's, uh, detection of external or internal stimulation. And what I meant by that is just simply this. A baby has an internal, intuitive stimulation. That's a survival mode. And on a baby, it manifests mostly in its lips. In other words, its ability to nurse. And have you ever seen babies when they're born, they have a little bit of problem sucking and nursing? Didn't we just have one? And they have to clip the tongue a little bit so that it can pull mm -hmm. the nourishment out. What happens to that baby if it can't do that? Die. It's going to die. Mm -hmm. Well, you won't find that in the rest of the natural manifest world. You won't find it in the animal kingdom. You know, a lot of the mothers in the animal kingdom, if they see a weakness in that in that pup or kitten or calf or whatever, you know they'll push it away. Mm -hmm. They'll push it away yeah. and let it starve and die of its own. But they, have, they, they have an instinct that we have, but they have their instinct naturally and it's stronger and stronger and stronger in them. We don't. We only have an instinct to suck, to nurse. 
And the rest of our instinct has to be cultivated and developed only through knowledge. When you have knowledge and you incorporate your knowledge more and more and more, that knowledge will filter back into an instinct that you will develop and you will have. Otherwise, you won't have. Now that knowledge could be, if you lived out in the woods and that was your, that was your whole domain, then you would have a knowledge of what's going on in that environment that you're in and that knowledge would give you an instinct of how to survive in that in that environment now so that those different internal stimuli that we have that that the animal kingdom does have or the bestial kingdom does have first off is the instinct for nourishment all of us have that Okay, beast. I want to just give you these, and I'm not going to even try to get you to go over there. The word beast, the word beast is first found in Genesis 2, 7, and 8. Now, that's not the first place that the English translation uses it, okay? But I'm talking about from the Hebrew, here's how it's used. And this word, you can hear this word. This word in Hebrew is behema. What do you think of when you just hear the word behema? Big. Huh? Big. 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 Yeah. Exactly. The behemoth is like a, is like a uh, buffalo or dinosaur or any kind of a massive animal, right? Yep. Yeah, that's a behemoth. Well, that's exactly what the word means. And it's called beast, behemoth. The second place that the word beast is used is in Genesis 31. And it, it, this, uh, this word is terafa. Terafa. Terrify, and actually the word means prey or it means a, a piece of meat that's like ripped off or it means a like a raven tearing meat from something that's dead. That's what that word means, terrify. And then the third place, this is all the word beast, different Hebrew words meaning different things. The third place that the Hebrew word beast is used is in Genesis 2 9 and it's the word che which should never have been translated beast it should have been translated life so there's not anywhere in scripture you're going to see God's crowning glory compared to other portions of his kingdom it, it's not there you're not compared to an animal you're not compared to anything other than a tree of all things, God compares you to a tree. And all he's doing is trying to show us that the life in the tree and the life that's in you are the, the same life. That's the life of God that we have. So these are, the, these are usages of those words and how those words are used in Scripture. And just using the Scripture as a place uh, for confirmation or a place for change. Okay, let me go back over here. Genesis chapter 1. Did y'all find that opening? <laughs> that is the hardest one to find. Genesis 1. Let's just start reading with verse 1. It says, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. You know, and I'll have to say this. I, I'm sorry to announce that these are very, very poor translations, but this nevertheless, it's a story, it's what we've got, and we have to work with it, see what it's going to say. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let us uh, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called. And remember, I want you to pay attention to that word called. It's used right here in the first ten verses several times. And each time, it has to do with a name change or uh, given something else a name that has a similar or same meaning. And so we, in this case, verse 5, God called the light, that's the Hebrew word or, he calls it day, that's the Hebrew word yom. And so the word should have been life, L-I-F-E, or even better, I, I, just flip with me real quick over to Psalms 91, and let me show you this. This is just one place. I could, there's just so many other places, but this one is so clear, and actually, every one of you are familiar with this passage. Most everybody's familiar with Psalms 91, verse 14. 
Psalms 91 verse 14 says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I, I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath, he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him. And I will honor him. And with, what's that next word? Long life. Long life. That's the word yom. That's the same word for day. Now you listen to the context of this whole thing. It's like God saying, look, I, I'm, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to do this and I'm, going to, and I'm going to give you a day to do it. Now does there any sense made in that? So why would you use the word yom for day? Because automatically you're thinking in, you th your mind is thinking in word form. But long life and day don't make sense together. In the, in, there's just no way to put them. So when you can begin to see the word yom, when you find that word used in the Hebrew text, you realize it's talking about a long life. But it's not only talking about a long life, it's talking about a fulfilled life. It's talking about a happy life. It's talking about a blessed life. It's talking about a reproductive life. And it's used that way. All, all through the scriptures with different characters, different places, that's how the word yom is used. But in Genesis, they go out and they use this word day. And so you see the light represents life. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? Well, I mean, you know, we just sang a song about that. That makes a lot of sense. I resonate with that. So when I can say, okay, I can call light life. I can call light Happy life. I can call light long life. And I can associate myself with any of those places and realize if I want to live long, happy, then I'd have to put myself in a position to be receiving light. And so if I'm constantly receiving light, whether that light is enlightening my life through knowledge or I'm just availing myself to the light, isn't there something about the light that warms you, that comforts you, that does all of those wonderful things to you, for you, through you, in you? Yeah, amen. That's right. And so I would say, okay, the light he calls day and the darkness. Oh, okay. Well, wait a minute. Look at this word darkness. This is the Hebrew word chosek. And actually it means to be ignorant. Now, what you're going to see right here is you're going to see some biological science in these Hebrew glyphs because this is an analogy of the physical body, how it's, how it's built by these, these Hebrew glyphs. I told you the one, the one through the nine, they have the design in them, so in their design they have the ability to build a physical body or build anything else. And they do. And they will. So right here, we, we see right here, like day and the darkness, the Hebrew word right here for darkness, choshek, choshek, and actually the word just simply means to be ignorant or to be in darkness. Now, you hear the association of those words? If you are in darkness, then that simply means I'm just not in the know. So how do I get out of darkness into the no? In the light. It's like someone said, you want to know how to dispel the darkness? What do you do? The Flip the light switch on. Just turn the light on. Well, what is the light? It's knowledge. It's getting into the no. So I've got to know. Otherwise, I'm going to be in darkness. But now also, let me give you another way of using of this word. It also means dense darkness actually is material matter. In other words, this right here, physical body, flesh. That's dense darkness. It's physical body. So watch what it says. And what, let's just go on. And he called the darkness, this physical matter or ignorance, he calls it night. And now listen to this word night. The word night is layil. It's the Hebrew yod. Lamid, Yod, Lamid. And it's pronounced Layil. La, la, he, la Lamid. That's how, that's how that glip is pronounced. Lamid. It has a 30 value. It's like, uh, it, it actually, the 30 value in the Lamid actually means a teacher. 
In other words, when uh, in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, before you could become a priest or a teacher, you had to be thirty year old and married. That's, that's just a you had to be thirty year old and married. They weren't in no hurry. Okay, and so this word layil. Here's what it means. It means it means to fold back. Now I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up on what we're fixing to see done with these Hebrew glyphs right here up front. What we're going to do is we're going to see the first building block that builds the human body. The first building block, and the first building block is uh, is this. It comes from it comes from your father, and and then another one is over here in the egg of your mama. So through your father's seed is an RNA. In your mama's egg is an RNA. And when that seed, that single, penetrates that egg, what does it, what does it create? First thing it creates is this thing right here. It, it creates what we call a double helix or a DNA. So the first thing that you see right here in Genesis chapter 1, right out of the starting gate, is we see, a, we see the DNA created. And yet we thought it had to do with the, a day and a night. We thought it had to do with darkness and light. And it does. It does because the darkness is symbolizing matter because this is exactly what the DNA is going to build. It's going to build matter or the physical body that we think is solid and it's not. It's, it's really not, even though it feels solid, don't it? It looks solid. It looks like it in all these things, but that's not what it is. So, the night is layil, and it actually just simply means to twist. To twist together. That's what that word means. It means to twist it together. Okay? And that's exactly what the, the DNA is. It's just a twisted double helix of an RNA. Now, let's just read on. And God said, let there be a firmament. Now, this word firmament, uh, this, is a, this, is a, this word is, is a powerful word. But I want to see how it's compared because what it's compared to. But, but let me back up. I actually got ahead of myself about the, the night and the darkness because I wanted to get this last word. And the evening and the, wor- and the morning were the what? The first. first, okay. The, the first. Let's just uh, let's look at that word. Let's just pick on that one just a little bit. I forgot to. I want you to see this because once you see this, and I know, uh, I used to say, seeing is believing. It really is. Seeing will be, help give you, you and me understanding. So this word first is um, is the Hebrew word ekad. Let me just spell it up here for, for you. Ekad. This is first. Okay, this word first is ikad, and it's spelled alif, cheat, dalit. Alif has a one value, cheat has a eight value, and the dalit has a four value. Okay, that's the word ikad, and it's translated for the word first. So I want you to just hold your place in Genesis 1, turn with me over to Genesis chapter 25. Just, just a... Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25 and look at verse 25. And y'all, y'all remember this story. I know you do. You're Bible students, so you would remember this story. What is the, what is the verse 25? How does it read? Is anybody there? Mm-hmm. What does it say? The first 
first. And the what? First. Verse. And the first. Okay. Okay, that word first, that should be ikad, right? Isn't that the word for first? Because what does this mean, the first? Is this, is this comparing number one to number two? Huh? See, and you think up front that when you're reading over in Genesis and it talks about the first day, you're comparing the first day to the second day. And you're not. But you're given that assumption. But right here, it's obvious that you're comparing this first child to the second child. In other words, you're comparing number one to number two. So what, what follows number one? What's in front of number two? Number one. <laughs> That's real deep, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's real deep. Uh, but now let me show you something about this word right here. It's, a, it's just a phenomenal word. It's, it's translated for first. But look at it. This, you can see it. Rash, Alif, Sheen, Yod, and tov. <laughs> wow, is there any similarity in this word first and this word first? No. This word right here is ikad. This word right here is rashit. And the word rashit means first. Now, if I'm looking at Genesis 1 1, first verse, and I looked at the word in the beginning, that is this word right here, Rashit, with this glip in front of it. In other words, Bah Rashit is the first word in Genesis. Beth Rashit. Same identical word for first with the Beth. The word the Beth means container or a house. But this is the word for first then why would they take the word ikad, which doesn't mean a first, why would they do that in Genesis 1, 5, when it talks about the first day? See, the first facet, or we could say the facet of life that Genesis 1 is talking about. Go back over there with me too. And we can go on with this because it's all through scriptures and you'll begin to see there's just not any similarity between the word rashit that does mean first and the word ikad. So I'm sitting here and I'm saying, okay, then what in the world does this word mean? What, uh, what would this, this word used here? First, ikad. What does it mean? Now, watch the simplicity in this word. I'll just put it like this. Can y'all read that? Unify. What does it mean to unify? It means to unify these two that was folded back on each other. Because if you unify them, that's what you build is a DNA. That's, that's the first building block. That is the first building block to, to build the temple. And what's this all about? The scripture is about the temple that God's building for itself. And God's building a temple, a home, a house, a living place. He doesn't build it and say, I ain't going to move into it. I ain't going to live in you. Look at you. You drank, you cuss, you pour, you blah, 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 blah. Did you, does God do that? No, God moves into the thing. God lives in it, period. It, God's not in it because He thinks it's clean or not clean. God's not in it because He likes the way you eat or don't like the way you eat. God's in it because God loves you and me, period. That's unconditional. It's not based on condition, not based on what you do or don't do, what you did or didn't did. I mean, that's unconditional love. You can't go into the second chapter and the third chapter and say, Oops! Look what you did. I'm not going to live here no more. I'm moving out. Well, if God moved out, they would fall over. Yeah. Kaput. <laughs> the end. No more you. No more anybody. The end. Well, unconditioned just simply means I'm here for the duration. I'm here through long suffering. I'm here through patience. I'm here through kindness. I'm not leaving. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when you you got to you see we cannot with the same mind 
look in the Scriptures and think we're going to get something different, you can't do it. You've got to change your mind. You have got to come to a place. That's exactly what it means to be to repent. It means to change the way you think, the way you see things. I hardly know any Christians that's ever repented because they don't know how to think. They won't hardly change the way they think. They can't change the way they see things. It's difficult. I mean, over the, over the many years I've done this, I have, I have had so many people, oh, I love you, Brother Lynn, but... <laughs> and I start sharing the things that I see, and I'm, I've, been, I've been slow about doing this over these years because I know they're going to get mad and leave. <laughs> they're going to get upset when I say this. They're going to think, oh, my God, didn't it? And I found out that's exactly what happens. <laughs> and I'm not upset with them. I, I know I, I know it up front. <laughs> I know when I open my mouth and I begin to share things, uh uh-oh, I'm going to upset your apple cart if I do not. It's like Gary Tice used to say to me all the time. He said, I know you know something you ain't telling me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'd rather you didn't leave right now. I found out rather than to throw a whole load on people, it's best to give them a little bit at a time. Just a little here, a little drop here. A little drop there, and then all of a sudden they say, oh, okay. I didn't come into any of your life by first trying to take your Jesus away from you at all. I wouldn't dare do that. And I have had real close friends of mine do that to other people. When they hear what I'm saying and they see what I'm saying, I said, I'm not trying to take anything away from you. I'm trying to give something to you. I want to give you something that can serve you and help you for me too. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of taking it away. It's a matter of giving you the truth, giving you something that has substance, something that can feed you, something that can help you through the stress, through the struggle, through the war, through the turmoil, through the things that we're trying to work ourselves through. And I don't know anybody that's not in any of those places right now. Every one of you are in different places. Myself, we're in different places. And I'm trying to remove from me The idea that I'm struggling. I'm trying to, for me, I'm trying to get in the position that, Father, I want to learn the move of the dance. I want to learn the rules of the game because I want to play the rest of my life and have fun doing it. I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. And I want to be strong. And I am finding ways to do that. And that's exactly what God is after in my life, in your life, in every life. And if we would do that, if you and I do that, do you know what would be more, most benefited and most blessed by it? The earth and everything that environmentally it contains. In other words, everything on this globe would be better if you and me would get our act together. Everything, the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, everything, fish, fowl, bird, you name it, it would be better off. It's like I heard... Sagaru talking in one of his lectures, he said, he said, if you removed earthworms from the earth, everything on the earth in a year and a half would become extinct. Just by taking away an earthworm away. He said, if you removed a bee from the earth in less than three years, everything on the earth would die, including human beings. He said, but if you removed human beings from the earth, the earth would flourish like never before. Isn't that something? And yet God said, you're my crown and glory. You're my visible manifestation. Well, my God, I'm saying, let's become what we are supposed to be. Let's quit comparing ourselves to something we're not. Let's compare ourselves to something we are. Compare yourself to the very thing that gives you the life to live yourself. See, this is not a salvation message to try to get young people out of of a riotous living life or old people from getting old and dying. It's a message to redeem us all and let us be greater at who we are, wherever we are, whether I'm 5 or 10 or 20 or 50 or 100. Hallelujah. So if I'm going to use the word rashit for first, that's a proper use for the word. But to use the word ekad for first is an improper use for the word. But if I could understand, if I had to put, I'm unifying the day, and if it had translated, I said, now we're unifying life. 
Because remember, I'm going to call the light life. And so now I'm unifying this life. I'm folding it back. I'm creating a double helix. I'm creating a DNA. Now you have to be honest with me. Does that not make a whole lot of sense? It does. You know what? It's like I always said, if the Scriptures and the revelation of the truth does not make logical, reasonable sense, and I don't know if I can grasp it, things that don't make logical sense for me, I've got to grapple with them a little bit more for me. If it's not logical, I've got to grapple with it. So I'm, I'm pretty simple-minded. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not into things that's not of that nature. I'm not saying they're not. You know, because a lot of people may have much greater revelation than I would have. Okay, look at verse 6. And God said, Let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters, and let, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the ferment and divided the waters which were under the ferment from the waters which were above the ferment. And it was so, and God called. Here we go. Now watch this. We've got to pay attention. You remember what we saw just a minute ago when God called the light day. It wasn't what we thought. But now look at this. It says, and God called the firmament what? Heaven. heaven. Wow, we're so far off on that one. God called it heaven. Sheen, Mim, Yod, Final Mim. That's the Hebrew word for heaven. It's called Shin Mim Yod Mim. Sha Ma Yim. That's how the word is pronounced. And this word right here, Shin Mim, I mean this glip, these two glips right here, you, you can kind of do them like this. Shin has a 300 value. It's referring to your breath. Mim has a 40 value. It's referring to everything in the material manifest world. Everything in the material manifest world lives off breath. I don't care if it's a fish in the water, a bird in the air, or a human being setting it down here this, this afternoon. This, this part of this phrase refers to your material manifest self. Do you know there's how many aspects to you? You're a dual being. There's two aspects of you. There's a spiritual aspect and the physical aspect. There's the divine and there's the human, Right? Exactly. And so that, that refers to your human aspect. Then this word yod, here we go. That's the number 10. And this is the final mem. This goes up into the three digits. That's 600 value. So this is, this is your divine or your cosmic or your spiritual manifest being. So how many of you have that? And that's more. this is more psychic than it is physical. Spirit. Spirit psychic. Your spirit is your psyche. It's your, that's your spirit right there. So here you have your, your physical. And here you have your spiritual. And so that's exactly what the word heaven means. It doesn't mean a place out yonder. It doesn't mean a planet you get to go to. It means you. That's why Genesis 1 talks about heaven and earth. Shamayim and Eretz. Eretz is the, is the physical material that God uses as the spiritual to build the house that He lives in. So it's a combination. Heaven and earth is a combination. You're both heaven and earth. Heaven and earth is not a place you go to. Heaven and place is a place as you are. You can't go to where you are. You're already there. <laughs> You'd be a hell of a mess trying to find yourself when you're sitting in yourself. But we are. We're doing that. We're looking for ourselves and can't find ourselves. Like a fish looking for water. Exactly. Like the fish looking for the water. Where's the water at? Where's it all? You know? In Him. In it. I live. I move. I have my being. That's Shamayim and Eretz. So when he takes this word right here, he calls, it's a ch name change. He calls the firmament. That's the Rakhof. Rakha. And that... that it's the same thing. And so when you look at these words and you begin to put them together by the Hebrew characters and you realize, wow, here's what they, here's what they mean. And verse 8, it says, And God called the firm at heaven and the evening and the morning were the what? Okay, the second. This is the Hebrew word. Oh, this is beautiful. Uh, second. This is first. Let's do second right here. 
This is the second. That's the sheen, nun, and yod. And this word is pronounced shine. Shine. It's beautiful when you start to see what this, what this word means. It don't mean what you think that this word means. If you will go with me to Genesis chapter 41. Just real quickly. You can't even imagine how many hours, now days, weeks, months, it took me to dig these little simple things out. You hadn't got a clue. I have worked on this. I have worked on this so long, so much time. Just to, just to unravel this little simple things that like this. Once you see them, they're simple. But when you can't see them, they are complicated. They're difficult. But when you start to see it and you start to get your eyes open, oh, okay, that makes sense. So I got suspicious out of the first verse. So I didn't get out of the starting gate, Genesis 1. I thought, whoa. I mean, what if this is like how, how it is throughout the rest? It is. It is. If you don't dig it out, uncover all of the styrofoam and get down to the gold and the silver and the precious stones, all you got's wood, hay, and stubble. And I'm going to tell you, every time it comes a good fire, every bit of you going to get burned up. And it happens to us constantly. Because the fire constantly was coming. Genesis 41. And look at, look at verse, uh, verse 43. Genesis 41, verse 43. And he made him to ride in the what? In the what? In the second. Okay, let's see what this word is. This is the, the word second. Okay, that's the word second, shine. This is the word second, and this word right here is mish, nay. This is shine, second. This is mish, nay, second. Don't sound alike, ain't spelled alike. Both of them are pronounced second. Now it says right here in Genesis, it said, made this guy to ride in the second chariot. So does that mean that there's a chariot in front of the second chariot that's probably the first chariot? So the second chariot follows the first chariot, right? right. So one number one is in front of number two and number two is behind number one, right? right. Well then what in the world is this word shine over here in Genesis chapter one? Let's go back over there and let's look at that word again. This word shine over here actually means this. Double. Double. That's what the word shenay means. Double. Like a double helix. So if you look at this scripture, you can understand now then we, we're not into a seven day creation at all. I, matter of fact, I'm going to say this, and I'm still actually working on this one. I'm pretty sure I can break down the first chapter and the first four verses of the second chapter into four categories. I'm, I'm nearly positive I can because there are four letters that have to do with all life on the physical earth and there are four letters in ancient Hebrew that have to do with all life. And those four letters in ancient Hebrew are this right here. Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And that word yod hey vav hey got translated Jehovah, our Lord. But yet it has to do with the physical. You have two hays in this word. One of them has to do with physical, the other has to do with the psychological. Those are the two aspects of your being. Psychological is the spiritual, the physical is the material manifest. The dense darkness, the matter. So I would, I, I'm working on this and I know that I can extract it from it because I already can see it. 
that I can break it down into these four letters. Now we also have an English, and I can't remember exactly, I think I talked about it last month, didn't I? Talk about the four letters in the A, A, E, A, T, C, G. So in biological science, you can look that up. You can just Google it right there on your phone, and it'll give you those four. And it will tell you all life in the physical world comes from those four letters. So my, my proposition is this. There's no seven such things as days here. There are four letters that builds every bit of life. That's a medical, biological fact. And I say the Hebrew uses that in these four glyphs right here. yod heh vav -Hey. So when I begin to see that and I begin to realize the first is not the first. The first is actually referring to only one axis of the double helix or one axis called the RNA. And when I put them both together and I double them, shene, I have a DNA. I have something to build with now. And so the, every one of you are individually unique, never been another like you ever before, period. I mean, is God great or what? <laughs> I mean, it's like his ways are past finding out. Yes. Yeah. But we are finding out a little bit here and a little bit there. And thank God for the little we find. And uh, we, if we, we, what we want to do is not just, not just find it, implement it. Put it into action. Put it into, put it into practice <coughs> in our lives. Okay. All right. I'll, <coughs> I'll quit. <laughs> I give up. <clears throat> My throat's that was abrupt. raw. Uh, what did you say? That was abrupt. That was it? Yeah. That was, that's quick. Short and sweet. Any questions? Everybody good? A lot to think about. I get upset when I all the mistranslation. That's just that's just deception at its purest, you know. <laughs> but it's really it's um it's enlivening and it's uh, it's exciting when you pull the truth out of it. Um, and I don't focus on the deception behind it. Um, and I imagine for people growing up with the Bible, it's probably freeing, you know, because. I, I, I got to a certain age where I just blocked it out, and I don't even like touching the book anymore. But um, you know, for a lot of people, you know, you spend your whole life um, studying that book, and I'm sure it's a lot of questions, a lot of turmoil. Um, but I like how you bring out the truth of it, Papa. You can't throw the book out because you're throwing the baby out with the door. Well, see, I, I hear his frustration because I, I was that way. you got to realize I have been in this path now since I was in my mid-20s, 25, 26 is when I had my conversion experience. And uh, <coughs> I've been pastoring for 40-plus years, well over 40 years. So <coughs> my frustration was exactly what he talked about. But then I got past that. Yeah. Because something in me said there's truth in there, <clears throat> and I wanted yeah. to find it, and so I've spent the last thirty years, right at thirty years, digging out my way out for a long time of everything I had been buried in in the first ten or fifteen years of my Christian walk. So <clears throat> it takes a while to dig all that stuff out. Yeah. And to get you know get clear, because you can't imagine. He talks about frustration. You can't imagine the frustrations that I would have when I would see something, I, and I just shove it back. I throw my Bible back. I would get mad at the translators. I'd get mad at this, that, and other because how come these intelligent people can't see this? Why didn't they see it? If you can't see it, you can't see it. And sometimes it does take a physician. To move the scales from your eye. I'm not saying I'm a physician, but maybe I am. What if I am? What if I do know what I'm talking about? If it can resonate with you and you can see it, it could be something free in you. Thank you for all your research. Well, that's all what, the time you spent. Exactly. And that's what, you know, like you said, we have no idea, 
you know, how much time, how much, but we can't even begin to tell you how much we appreciate. Oh, you know, yeah, well, thank how you. How many hours, how many days and yeah. years you've done that to help us, to give to us. To you, you see, we can't it, begin to tell you it, has, it has been really hard and laborious, and it hasn't. It's my passion. Yeah, I, yeah. So it, it, I can, you know, I can do that for hours. It's my passion you, to do that. But you have to get it, and you have to figure out how to... Give it so that we can get it without yeah. all of that stuff that you've done. And that must be tremendous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. It's wonderful. Hallelujah. It is wonderful. It really is. Yeah. I think you'll ever get out of Genesis. No, I don't think so. No, I am already convinced that. I, I, I don't think that Jesus says unless the foundation of the house is put right. In a solid place, yeah. in the stone. Yeah. The storms of life are inevitable because we live in a world of cold and hot. We live in that world. Even if you live on the equator, you're still going to experience everything from the North Pole and the South Pole. You're going to experience the calamities, the sicknesses, the everything that's here.